Hello and welcome to Making Tech Better, Made Tech's fortnightly podcast bringing you content from all over the world on how to improve your software delivery. My name is Claire Sudbury, my pronouns are she and her, and I am a lead engineer at Made Tech. October is Black History Month, so for this episode we're publishing an interview with Charlene Hunter from back in July 2021. Charlene is the founder of Coding Black Females, which means that she knows a lot about the issues facing black women in our industry, and more generally about opening doors for underrepresented groups in tech. I know from working with Charlene just how passionate she is on this topic, so it was a delight to talk to her. Hello, Charlene. Hi, Claire. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's really great to see you again. So the reason I said that is because Charlene and I used to work together at Made Tech because Charlene used to organize our internal academy program. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, not just the academy, but generally training, learning, how people can learn to be most specifically a software engineer, but also how they can just, you know, get into this industry that we find ourselves in. So first of all, Charlene, obviously, I'm going to ask you about the Academy. So in a nutshell, how would you describe MadeTech's Academy program? The MadeTech Academy is a 12-week in-house training program to develop people from being maybe people that have come off boot camps or come out of university to become software engineers and like useful, I suppose, and good on a project once they've finished. So on the Academy, we would teach quite a range of skills. It was it was less about learn to code and more about learn to be a developer or software engineer, that sort of thing. Yes. So tell me a bit about that distinction. Some people might think, OK, learning to code and learning to be a developer, they're the same thing, aren't they? What's the difference? So I think they're, they're actually quite different. So when I meet people who are learning to code, often it's how do I do this in JavaScript? What's a variable? What's a, I don't know, a function or something like that? So that's learning to code. It's understanding how to take a language, put it together and make something happen. Mm -hmm. And I think with a developer, normally, or an engineer, they would have an understanding of how coding works. So you'd understand all the constructs, how everything fits together, but you'd be able to produce projects and, and applications. And I would expect that a software developer would be able to work well on a team as well. So it's a bit more than just, not that there's anything wrong with just coding, but it's a bit more than just coding. It's it's more around, you know, how you actually build projects with other people by yourself and using the other available tools that are out there as well. Yeah, that's funny because now that you've described it, it's like, well, obviously there's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're finding people to take part in a program like this, how do you find the right people? So I believe that most people can learn to code and can put things together. So what I'm really looking for is people who want to learn how to do it well, who are passionate about it. So who can express that they have some level of passion. Not everyone's going to like have a massive smile when they talk about tech or code, but I guess I want to see some level of excitement. I want to know that they are going to be able to, to look after themselves through that learning process. So people who are able to go away, take resources, learn something and come back either with some really useful questions or with something that they're delivering. So it's the ability to learn, mm. I think, is what you're really looking for. Yeah. But also some level of passion and excitement in that area too. So you touched on something there because you talked about, you know, people will express excitement in different ways. I haven't actually said, but Charlene and I worked together on our internal academy program. And I know that when we were recruiting, one of the things that we were really conscious of is diversity. And this applies to all recruitment that you might have an idea in your head that you're looking for people who get excited about things, but people get excited about things in different ways. Exactly. And you have to take that into account. And there are lots of other things about how when people have ideas in their head about what they're looking for, so they might, without realising it, be looking for a white person, for instance, because they're looking for somebody like themselves. But they'll also have ideas about what passion looks like, what good looks like. And it will typically be within quite a restricted sphere of what they're used to. So, you know, what kind of techniques can you use to try and make sure that you're not 
subconsciously filtering for people who are just like you? I think it's really important to have loads of different ways of capturing data. So, for example, with the Academy process, we had coding tests, we had screening calls, we then had a full day of of talking to somebody and, and doing some pair programming. So there's loads of different ways there to identify passion. Mm-hmm. It could be that they've written loads of comments or something when they were doing the coding test and you're like, actually, you know, they might not have smiled a lot when they were talking to me on Zoom, but they wrote loads of comments and I can see there's really loads of excitement there and that's how they express their excitement. Mm. It could be that, you know, when they were doing their pair programming, the way that they went about asking questions shows that they're excited there. So I think that the key thing is to make sure that you've got enough ways to understand and allow people to show that side of themselves so that it's not just, okay, there's there's one way to get in. And if you don't meet that way, we don't accept it. Mm. So I know that one thing that we definitely did on the Academy was we had loads of different types of questions and we had loads of ways to try to get the answers out of people so that it wasn't just around, okay, they didn't say this answer. It was, okay, if they haven't said this answer, but what have they said? And how can we help them to get to an answer to express themselves in the way that they probably, you know, would truly represent themselves as well? Yeah, yeah. And also not necessarily wanting a particular answer, because that's something that I notice in recruitment is people will say they'll have a checklist. They'll say, I want the people that I interview to say A, B, C and D. And so effectively, in order to try and get those answers out of them, they ask closed questions. Mm -hmm. And the problem with that is that the person on the other end of that question can generally tell. I've been in that situation so many times where somebody asked me a question in an interview and I'm like, oh, there's obviously a particular answer that they're trying to get out of me. And I can't work out what that answer is. And then I panic. And then I'm like, oh, God, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. That's often a problem. So how do you get around that? So one thing that we did when we were getting the academy ready, right, we sat down together and we went through and sort of said, with this question, are we trying to get this particular answer? And if the answer was ever yes, then we would change the question or remove it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's identifying that up front, right? It's understanding that. Yeah. One of the most exciting things that I had when I was interviewing on the academy was... I got to learn new techniques from the people that we were interviewing. We'd ask a question around time management or organizational skills. And because we're not looking for them to say, this is how I manage my time or whatever, um, we were able to learn as well. So it was actually a great experience on both sides. It was a conversation yeah. rather than this is a question where I need this answer because we'd sat down mm. and we said we don't want them to have to like fall into this particular box in the beginning. So I guess one way of expressing that is that we were asking open questions rather than closed questions. And exactly what you say, give them a chance to give us information that we didn't even expect. Mm -hmm. You know, give them a chance to tell things about themselves that we never would have thought of in advance. But when they tell us those things, it's like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And give everybody a chance to give different impressive answers. And then you get a diverse set of people rather than them all being the same as each other. So as well as having worked on the Academy with Made Tech, you also, before and after and now, run Coding Black Females, which is an amazing organisation. So tell me about Coding Black Females. Yeah, um, Coding Black Females is my ultimate passion, I would say. So I set it up a few years ago, initially just to meet other black women in the tech industry. Now, we actually do quite a lot. So we have loads of training that we offer. We have loads of events. We've got this huge, like fantastic community of people supporting each other. And we work with a lot of companies as well to, to one, support their recruitment, but also to ensure that they've got good environments for the women that we have in our network as well. So we're working quite broadly with a lot of organizations, but with a lot of people in our network to make sure that people are having good experiences when they go to work, when they get into tech, when they're working in the industry. So it's actually quite exciting for me. And of course, people can't see, but as Charlene is talking, there's just a massive, great big smile on her face. (laughs) (laughs) Everyone says that. They're like, oh, you're smiling loads now. That's what I found out. It was a passion of mine because I smile a lot when I talk about it. (laughs) Oh, isn't that wonderful? If I was to say, what is the most important raison d'etre for coding black females? What's the most important thing that you see yourself as achieving? So our focus is getting more black women into the industry and supporting progression through the industry. Mm -hmm. So what we ultimately want to see is more black women in leadership positions in the tech industry, in the tech space, because that's important. And without that, we're not going to build the right technology. 
we're not going to have good experiences as black women with technology either. So that's what I want to see. And that's why, you know, we do all these different types of activities with that aim in mind that it will be equal. It will be fair. There'll be the right representation that there should be in all the right roles. Yeah. So that's our key focus. Ultimately, we're looking towards getting more black women into leadership positions in technology. Mm, Yeah. And how? How? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. How are you doing that? You're not supposed to ask me that. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I guess there's quite a lot that we do. We've spoken a bit about training. So we run quite a few different training programs. One of those is the Black Coder Bootcamp, which is looking at getting more black women in at the entry level. So that's enabling people to get over barriers that they might have had previously to get into tech. And those barriers could have been not having the finances to do a boot camp or go to university to do like a conversion course of masters in computer science, that sort of thing. It could be that they just didn't know about it. They hadn't seen other people before who were doing it. They didn't think it was something they could do. So we're showing them that they can do it. So we create this program that enables loads of people to get into the industry Other work that we do around training is looking at people who have been in the industry for a lot longer. So they might have been in the industry for around 10, 15 years, and they're then being trained to become leaders or to recognize that they are leaders. Mm. So, for example, we started a first uh, leadership accelerator program. Mm. And with that, we're running a 13 week program looking at negotiation skills, managing stakeholders, technical vision and a bunch of things so that we can get these women who are already doing it already in the industry, already awesome, showing that they can progress to that next stage. So we're really looking at enabling more people to get in, but then also supporting that progression and showing people what they're already doing. Another thing that we really focus on is the visibility of role models. So we have loads of events and we do events like twice a month currently. No, we don't. We do events like once a week. There's a lot of events that happen. (laughs) And one of the key things that we look to do there is we want to have black women on stage talking about what they do in tech. I don't want them talking about black women. I want them talking about what they do in tech. And I want other black women to see that so they see the representation and know that they can achieve it as well. So there's that element of visibility. Another thing that we do is we've run our social media campaign, our Visible in Tech campaign for the last year. And that on a weekly basis showcases a black woman who is in the tech industry and they tell their story on social media. And I think for me, that's made a huge impact because people can see other people, they're inspired, and it makes them want to stay in the industry and be in the industry too. So I think they're the key things really. It's like the events, the training, and then obviously we work with companies to ensure that they're creating the right space so that when we put people forward or when people apply for roles that we've listed, that they're going into good companies. And I I love the idea that companies are setting up partnerships with you Mm -hmm. because that really tells me that they're paying attention to diversity, that they do want to make a difference. This is a cynical question, I have to confess. (laughs) But have you ever been in a situation where you feel like people are contacting you purely as a box ticking exercise and they're not really committed, that they don't really care, to be honest? Yeah, and you can tell pretty quickly. Yeah. You can tell from the conversation, I always ask, what they're currently doing about diversity, what they're currently doing to to tackle the problem. And you normally see pretty quickly whether they're actually focused on it or whether they're like, actually, someone told me to contact you yesterday. Mm. So I'm doing it today. Mm -hmm. Can you just let me know the quickest way to get a solution, please? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it doesn't work like that. Yeah. There isn't a quick solution to fixing a problem that is built into our society. Yeah. Um, It's a a long-term thing. And, And I guess what we kind of look for is companies that are, They understand that if they support us with delivering training or running events, that they're not going to necessarily recruit five people or 10 people at the end of that, that they might recruit people in one or two years time because they've shown that that's something they're passionate about. Mm. So I think you can see very quickly they're not actually genuinely in it for the right reasons. Mm. And do you sometimes just, you know, exit as a result? Yeah. So there's people that I've said until this has been done in your organisation, then we won't work together. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But with those bigger partnerships, do you actually run training programs for them? I mean, do you kind of run any on-site or internal training programs for people? There's some companies that say, could you run something with our leadership team where we get our like other partners who deliver diversity training or unconscious bias training, those sorts of things. I don't do that with the expectation that they're going to do a training course and then they're going to know how to have a great organisation that's 
not got any racism or bias in it. Mm -hmm. I do that um, with the expectation that that's part of a bigger program. So if someone said to me, could you just come in and do this training? I'm probably going to say no. Um, There's other companies that do that. But if they say, can you do this training? Because we want to know this, but we also want to make sure that we're supporting the community in this way. That's when I'd probably say, yeah, that's fine. Let's, Let's work together on that. Yeah. So I know that you run boot camps as an organization. Do you ever do any of that? You know, so actually training engineers up on behalf of other companies, or is that always an independent thing? Yeah, so that's something that we're going to be looking at next year is definitely big on our plan is doing those internal training courses. Because we do so much of it anyway, running those sorts of training internally would be perfect. But we have got some companies where we run entire cohorts for their organizations. Mm -hmm. So we'll take on, say, 20 people and we train them all up to then go and work in those organizations. So absolutely, we run the courses either for the community or for the company to get people into that company as well. So, yeah. Yeah. But either way, the focus is still black females. The focus is black females. When we run internal corporate training, the key thing there is that we are delivering it. So I think that there's benefit in companies seeing black women running training. Yeah. Because we're awesome. Yeah. So it's awesome, right? (laughs) So so with that, it doesn't have to be that only black women are allowed to access the training in those companies. It's more about the fact that we're going in and we're delivering it as a training company. So we do quite a few workshops that we've run where we've done those on behalf of companies like Intro to Coding so they can show their staff what it could be like if they were moving into tech. Mm. We've seen that happen quite a lot with a lot of the larger organisations where they have a retail side and then a tech side because the retail part of a lot of businesses are closing at the moment. Right. So they're trying to retrain their staff to then move into those tech roles. So that's where we're doing a lot of that training or those those sort of taster courses where people are then saying, okay, this is what tech is. Actually, maybe I could move from retail into this. And then it opens the door up a lot to people in those sort of roles to move into the tech roles. Yeah, yeah. And generally, when you're training people, I know one of the things that made tech that we really emphasize about the academy program, and you've touched on this a bit when you've talked about support, is that we're teaching people for 12 weeks, in our case, become software engineers or to enhance their software engineering skills. But then after that, it's their job. And what's not helpful to people is to just chuck them out into the world and abandon them because it can be quite daunting. So not only do we want to support them, but we also want to make learning be a part of everybody's professional life. Yeah, It's not just a thing you do for 12 weeks and then you stop. That's not even an option in this industry. You, you have no choice. Everything changes so quickly. You have to keep learning. And I was thinking, is that another thing that you do as part of Coding Black Females, kind of support? people just generally with learning in the industry yeah so we do quite a lot of we do we we do loads of stuff right but (laughs) um, one of the things that we offer is uh, mentorship and, and support in that way so we have either mentorship programs that will run with companies where people get one on one support over a 12 week period from company representatives or we have people who sign up to us as mentors and then we pair them with mentees within our network So we do provide that support. What we've started to do as well as a core team is we're offering office hours now. So every week, I think we've got about 12 slots available to our members to call up and just have a chat about something in tech they want support with. Mm. So we're trying to make sure that people have that level of support, that they know there's always somewhere to go. What we found with the boot camp was the people that have gone on to roles One of the questions that we ask to the companies before they go is, you know, what's your learning and development process or plan within your organization so that we know that we're not just sending them in cold somewhere. Yeah. But then at the same time, because we've given them a mentor for the entire time they're learning, they've then got someone to support them once they're in as well. So there's a large focus on mentorship within our network. And that could either be one-to-one mentoring or what I see a lot is kind of ad hoc support that people give to each other throughout anyway. Yeah. So I think by building community and by bringing people together in that way, you almost get it naturally. And then we put a little bit of structure around it as well. While I've got your attention, let me tell you a bit about Made Tech. After 21 years in the industry, I'm quite choosy about who I'll work for. Made Tech are software delivery experts with high technical standards. We work almost exclusively with the public sector. We have an open source employee handbook on GitHub, which I love. We have unlimited annual leave. But what I love most about Made Tech is the people. 
They've got such passion for making a difference and they really care for each other. Our Twitter handle is MadeTech. That's M-A-D-E-T-E-C-H. We have free books available on our website at madetech.com slash resources slash books. And we're currently recruiting in London, Bristol, South Wales and the north of England via our Manchester office. If you go to madetech.com slash careers, you can find out more about that. Before we return to the interview, just a quick reminder that before the break, we were talking about giving mentoring and support to learners and not just abandoning them to the world of work after they complete training programmes. Have you found that because of what you've been doing that you have learned about learning? I've learned a lot about learning. Or maybe a better question. What have you learned about learning, Charlene? (laughs) I've learned so much about learning because it's not something that I used to do. So my background, I've, I've been a software developer my whole time and then a technical architect and then a tech lead, whatever. Focusing on learning has been really interesting. And I guess the things I've found is the different styles, there's different ways people can learn. What I've seen happen with so many people when they're learning is the... I always sort of deem it as the bit where you're kind of climbing up a hill and it's it's then get to this really steep bit and then you get to the top and you can just see the horizon and you feel okay again. Yeah. I guess I didn't recognise those sorts of things before. So it's I guess it's the learning styles. It's knowing what it's like when somebody is is near that breaking point. But when they're near the breaking point, they're also near to really fully understanding something as well. And it's understanding the the level of support people would need and what it could be like to go through these sorts of things. So one thing that we learned from the boot camp especially was they spent a year, the the last ladies we had, they went through the boot camp and people were going through all sorts of things at the same time because it was also COVID times as well. Mm. You know, there was this new scary thing. They were also learning this new scary thing and they were still living their lives and they were all at home on their own because of the pandemic, which was really tough. And we realised that we weren't equipped to support them with that. So this time around, we've added in counselling and and that sort of support Ah. so that when they're learning, they've got somewhere to go who can actually give them the right support if they're struggling with anything. I think I've also learned a lot about neurodiversity, different types of people, the way that having your slides in a particular way could impact them. Yeah. We do slide based learning. So we do lecture style, then they'll do exercises and then we'll make sure there's video. So there's loads of different ways that they can learn. But then even with the slides, every slide had orange on it. And some people found that difficult because of their neurodiversity. And then that meant that they weren't able to learn in those sessions. So it's just, there's all these things that I've never even considered. I just thought, okay, you want to learn to code? I'm going to give you code. Cool. (laughs) (laughs) But there are so many other things. People go through things when they're learning. People drop off for different reasons. People stick around for different reasons. They need different levels of support. And it's important to figure out what those things are and give it to them, really. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And how did you get into it? So, you you know, you mentioned that you are yourself a software engineer and and have been for a long time. But now, I mean, Coding Black Females is your main thing, isn't it? How did that happen? As you say, you know, I've been a software developer for a good while now. And Coding Black Females, I've been doing for the last four years anyway. It started off with people who were more senior, so people like me in in tech, coming together and just talking about what we do. Mm -hmm. And probably talking a lot about the experiences we'd had as well, which I think was just really fantastic to be able to talk about experience as a Black woman in the tech industry. It's great. But then what we found was that we also had a lot of people who would then start attending who would ask, how can I get into tech? So then we started to try to make sure that we had resources for them or information to give to those people when they would ask those questions. So we naturally then started running workshops because that's what people needed. We wanted to make sure the community was supported to get what they wanted. And then when companies would say, we're looking for this, I would say, well, I know these people because I've been working with them to train them. Yeah. So it all kind of, it was very organic. So it's based on the fact that we've grown a community around technology because we're Black women in tech we're inspiring other people to want to be in it. Yeah. And then they ask us how they can be in. So we deliver that training, we deliver that support. And one of the key breaking points, I guess, last year, I was invited along as Canaan Black Females. We ran a workshop at a conference and they said, you know, we've been invited in to do this bid. Do you want to go on, go along with us to put this bid together for a boot camp? And I was like, yeah, cool. Like, can't be, can't be that hard to run a boot camp, can it? It's really easy. <laughs> so, <laughs> so then we went in and we did this and, and then we built a boot camp. 
And now we've got that, but we've also got other training programs because we look at the areas that are needed in industry. Like we know what the skills gaps are, but we also know what skills we have and what skills we can find in order to train people. So it's really been, it's been a very, it's been very organic. Sometimes I'll have a conversation with a company and they'll say, you know, we need this skill and I'll go back to the team and we'll create some training around it and generate the skill and then give those people the access, those opportunities, if you know what I mean. So it's really... It's about listening. It's about learning from the people around you so that you can then provide the right thing to the people within the community. Fantastic. Going back to the Make Tech Academy and other similar schemes that you've seen, when you see those in-house programs where you're recruiting people directly to your own company and then you're training them up and, 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 and giving them a job, do you think that those schemes have a particular benefit? How do you feel about those kinds of schemes? I think there are huge benefits to those schemes. I think one thing that is fantastic is being paid whilst you're learning because that's that's amazing, right? It means there are genuinely no barriers then, which is fantastic. I think the other thing is that because you're an organisation and you know how you build things, how you work with your customers, you know how you do all of that, you can then train people who are going to be beneficial to your company, which reduces the amount of time that you have to mold somebody after they come in from another program if you know what I mean yeah not that you should try to mold everyone to be the same but it's more that you're teaching them the right skills that are going to be suitable for your business and then they can be useful straight away yeah because I think that when you're learning at the entry level it's really important to be on a project or be contributing something as soon as possible yeah because otherwise you just feel like you've learned it but you're not good enough yet and mm -hmm. you have all the confidence that you start coming in you know mm -hmm. so I think that it means that you can get somebody working a lot quicker and you've got that structure of support as well so when you provide them with mentors and supporters all those people will already know how your business works how you use technology and everything so I think that that's where the huge benefit is. It's the structure that you can give them internally that you might not always be able to give them when you're doing it outside. Yeah, yeah. I always think of it as three things, recruitment, retention and diversity. That when I'm thinking about the benefits of our academy, first of all, it means that we get to recruit people, you know, and recruitment is hard in IT. And I think when you get out of this idea that we must find people who are already fully fledged, fully formed, have learned all the things, mm -hmm. that actually that's not necessary. We can teach them the things that we need them to know. Then recruitment becomes a lot easier. But also those people... You've given them something that's really important to you, but also really important to them. So then you've got the retention piece, you know, that they've built up a relationship with you that's really important to them. So they're more likely to hang around. But then the other really big one is the diversity piece when you do it properly. You know, when you think about all of the things that we've talked about and, and you're not just looking for one size fits all, you're deliberately trying to find people who are different from one another then you, you find that certainly in my experience, the diversity figures for the recruitment to the academy are better. I'm pretty sure that, you know, we get better gender diversity, better racial diversity, better neurodiversity, mm -hmm. <laughs> like because we're deliberately looking for people who are different. And because they're at the beginning of their journeys, I think they haven't yet had horrible experiences and left. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not yet. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think you're definitely right there. Mm. Because I think that that means a lot to a person um, when they know that someone said, OK, we believe in you. We're going to invest all of this time in you. Mm -hmm. You're going to stick around for longer because you know that you matter. The times I see people leave a lot, especially earlier on in their career, is when they've gone somewhere who said that they cared, said they were going to try and support them after they've come out of different boot camps or, you know, after uni or whatever. And they just haven't done anything at all, you know? Mm. And then they're like, actually, I just feel, I feel horrible. Like I need to go somewhere else. And then we try to find them somewhere else. But I think that that makes such a difference, knowing that a company is willing to put that time into you, willing to invest in you in that way. Mm. It just really helps with the likelihood that you're going to stick around. Yeah. And but also what you just hinted at, that you have to actually put your money where your mouth is as well. It's no use saying that you're going to support people. You have to actually do it. Mm, absolutely. And that makes a big difference as well. Absolutely. Yeah. So what would you like to see in the future? What would Nirvana look like for you in this industry? Nirvana for me is essentially to not have organisations like mine, right? Yeah. And that's the thing. I want there to not be a need. I want people to go to work and not experience racism, not experience issues, you know, be treated fairly 
And I want a black woman to be as likely as a white man to be interviewed and then progress to the next level or be taken into a new job, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. I want that to be as likely. I want to see leadership be well represented in organisations, which I just don't see. And I feel like it's going to take a long time to change. But that's what I want to see. I want to see that representation and people to be able to be themselves when they go to work and not feel as though they have to hide any part of themselves. Because I hear so many horrible stories and I have so many stories of my own experiences. I just don't want people to have that anymore. I feel like it's just been going on for too long and I want it to stop. Yeah. So I want people to just be able to have a good time at work, go in, feel good, do what they got to do and be able to be themselves. But also, you know, there's the representation there and there's no issues around it. That's what I want. Wonderful. I love it. I want that too. <laughs> yeah. We'll get there, Claire. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so there's a few questions that I always ask all my guests. One of the questions I normally ask at the beginning, but I often forget, I forgot this time. Who are you inspired by in this industry? I find it difficult because there's a lot of people in my network that inspire me a lot. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like, I couldn't list all of their names because there's, there's so many people that inspire me all the time. Yeah. I think that I'm inspired by the people who are out there who are supporting other people or they're just like killing it. They're doing it. They're... They're excelling in what they're doing, you know, and they love it while they're doing it. They're the types of people that inspire me. I don't have names um, or anything like that. That's fine. But I think it's the people that are doing really well for themselves and that are enabling other people to do well for themselves as well. Oh, I love that. That's great. OK. And then the next question that I always ask everybody is tell me one thing about you that's true and one thing that's untrue. And we're not going to tell the listeners which is which. <laughs> they have to try and guess. But people who subscribe to our mailing list will get to find out what the true answer was. OK, I have been ziplining in Jamaica. OK. And I have done a skydive in Mexico. Oh, there sneaky, because they're mm -hmm. really similar. I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so tell me what it was like when you were ziplining in Jamaica. Tell me about that experience. It was really really scary so I'm afraid of heights so I don't know why I choose to do things that have heights in <laughs> I don't know why I do that but it was very scary it was very rickety the person who was on that with me was shaking the thing the, okay the thing the wire thing uh-huh um so yeah it was very scary but at the end it was fine Mm. So what about skydiving in Mexico? Skydiving in Mexico was also very scary because I am afraid of heights. <laughs> so I think I spent the entire time being concerned that the person who was attached to me was just not going to open their parachute. Oh, no. <laughs> so it was really scary. Yeah. So they were both very scary experiences. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done zip lining, but I've not done skydiving. And I... Uh, I think I would like to. I mean, the logic is that the person who's attached to you is also going to not want to die. So Yeah, I know. They're probably going to open their parachute, I guess. <laughs> I watched an episode of Hollyoaks. Um... <laughs> Tell me, what happened in Hollyoaks? <laughs> the wires were cut and it was just oh very scary. Oh, my God. So... <laughs> It was years ago. It put me off years ago, but I was like, no, I've got to overcome it. I've got to overcome it. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, so the very last question is, what is the best thing that has happened to you in the last month or so? And it doesn't have to be work-related. It can be anything. Oh, it is going to be work-related. Um, I don't think I have a best thing, but I get a message maybe like every week or every couple of weeks just being like, Charlene, I've just got a new job or I've just progressed in this way or this fantastic thing that's happened to me and I think that a culmination of all of those text messages that I get of people having good opportunities and good things happen to them within Code and Black Females is probably the best thing oh they're the things that make me call my mum and I get very excited so yeah yeah I think that's it I know it's not one thing it's a bunch of things but I would say all of those text messages together <laughs> is what has been the best thing that's happened to me in the last month oh I love it I love the idea of you calling your mum as well. <laughs> and I love the fact that this means that your mum is getting all of these lovely phone calls from you, giving her all this good news. Oh, yeah, she loves it. Yeah, <laughs> brilliant. And I lied, it wasn't the last question. There is one last question, <laughs> which is a really simple one. Where can people find you and do you have anything that you would like to plug? So people can find me personally. So I'm Charlene P. Hunter on Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn or whatever. So Charlene P. Hunter. Mm -hmm. I guess 
guess in general, like coding black females always have different ways to partner with us, but also different opportunities for our members as well. So I would literally just go to the coding black females website and go to the member zone or go to support us. And you can find out either how you can work with us to achieve awesome things or take some of the awesome things that we have going for our members as well. So yeah, that's what I would like to plug and that's how you can find me. Wonderful. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you. As always, to help you digest what you've just heard, I'm going to attempt to summarise it. When recruiting for a training programme aimed to train people up as professional software engineers, you need to be aware that being able to code is not the same as being a software developer. A key component in recruiting for such a scheme is to find people who are enthusiastic and able to learn independently. Think about diversity. Allow for applicants' strengths to show in different ways. Don't ask closed questions where you have a particular answer in mind. Be on the lookout for those and weed them out. Coding Black Females was originally set up by Charlene as a way of meeting other black women in the tech industry, but they now offer a variety of different types of training. They host a lot of events. They offer counseling and support for after people complete their training. And this has led to a huge supportive community and mentoring network as a result. They also support companies with recruitment and make sure they have good environments for the Women in Coding Black Females Network. They're aiming to make sure that black women have a good experience in this industry. And they're also aiming to get more black women into leadership roles and showcase black female role models. And they'll only work with organisations that are really taking this seriously. When you're training people, offer a variety of options to support different learning preferences. Think about things such as neurodiversity. The benefits to in-house training schemes when you get it right are threefold. So there's the impact on recruitment. When people are being paid while they're learning, they're going to be really keen to join. There's the impact on diversity. If you can offer a training scheme direct to people without degrees, then you're removing barriers. And there's also the impact on retention. If you're training people deliberately to be beneficial to your company, there's more chance that they'll stick around. Charlene is doing amazing work towards improving the experience of black women in our industry. But that doesn't mean the rest of us can be complacent. We can all pay attention to the experiences of people in underrepresented groups in our industry. We can all think about what we can do to redress the imbalances caused by racism and all other forms of prejudice. OK, that's not all. Stick around for extra content. Every other episode, this last short segment will be devoted to story time. Storytelling is useful for teaching, for unlocking empathy, and for creating a sense of shared connection and trust in your teams. I love telling stories to both children and adults. I'm actually a lapsed member of the UK Society for Storytelling. So the plan is that I'm going to be using stories to illustrate various points about effective software development. This time, because it's Black History Month, I've spoken to two of my black colleagues who told me some stories about their experiences. So I have Kaylee Derricott with me, who is a delivery manager at Made Tech, and I'm going to be asking Kaylee about experiences she's had as a black person in tech. Uh, and not just in tech, actually, just her experiences as a black person. And one of the things that we were going to talk about is people making assumptions. And I'm just going to hand it over to Kaylee. Uh, can you tell me about experiences you've had of people making assumptions about you? Yeah, of course. So there is a particular experience that happened at work, um, not at Made Tech, I should say. This was at another employer and with a client in the financial services sector. And we were having a workshop, a number of colleagues I'd worked with for a couple of years at that point. And we were trying to understand our customers a little bit better and the users of the application. Um, and this was a financial product that we were thinking of launching. And we had a variety of people in the room. We had people from legal to make sure we were saying the right things. We had people from the product team. Um, and we had um, myself and a few others from the digital team um, to talk about how we were going to build this application. And um, one thing that came up was there was 
an assumption in a lot of the content we had produced for this page that people would have a good sort of financial literacy and that they would have a lot of knowledge around what these products were and what some of the, the terms and the features meant. So that was challenged by someone in the group. And there was a slightly awkward moment where someone in, in that group sort of turned to me and there was this assumption that I came from a background where people weren't particularly well educated. Wow. And that was quite an uncomfortable moment that no one called out having to continue on in that workshop and working with that group and sort of brush it aside to make sure we could achieve the outcome was quite a difficult thing to have to do. I didn't feel like it was the right time to to call out what had happened, which I, I definitely regretted afterwards. Oh, that sounds like such an uncomfortable experience. So you say you regretted it afterwards. If you could do it again, what would you do differently? That's a really difficult one. Um, I've been in a few situations, some at work, some not at work, where people have said things that have made me uncomfortable. And I haven't always spoken up in those moments because I didn't quite know what to say yet, particularly in the work environment. And it's in those moments that I sometimes wish that others in the room were better allies and didn't just give me the uncomfortable look of, oh, I know that wasn't pleasant for you, and stepped in and said, that's inappropriate. So I didn't feel like it was all on me in those moments. That's what I was going to get to. Yeah, because the suggestion was that you'd done something wrong and you haven't done anything wrong. And the burden shouldn't be on you to fix situations like this. And that's why allies are so important, isn't it? That other people should also be paying attention. And a sympathetic look is not enough. You know, what you want is for people to take action on your behalf and actually acknowledge that something has happened and try and do something about it. Yeah, exactly. And that's not to say the sympathetic look isn't helpful. It's more than nothing. In those moments, it does make you feel a little bit seen. You do get that slightly warm feeling of someone else in this room gets what was wrong there. It just isn't enough. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, well, thank you so much for speaking to me. That was really interesting and useful. No worries. Happy to share. Okay, so I have Rennie Fadajay with me. Rennie is a software engineer at Make Tech. Hello, Rennie. Hi, Claire. How are you? I'm oh, good, thank you. So, Rennie, you and I have been talking about the fact that being black doesn't mean that you only hang out with black people. Do you want to tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, so I've had so many experiences with this. The one that comes to mind really prominently has been while I was still in school. So like from secondary school, college, university, it always felt like there was an expectation on me to fit in with the, I guess you could call it the black clique. And not to say that that was a bad thing, but I think having that expectation, it put a social pressure on me. And it just felt sometimes like the fact that I'm black, you sort of already taken me as like a piece, as a chess piece and put me on the board. Like, okay, I have to definitely want to grow with these people. I might not really like what they as a group might like to do they may not really relate with what I like to do I've met black people who like what I like I can relate with but when you feel as if oh automatically join this group of people it's almost like I have to not be myself yeah and it's ultimately would you agree that it boils down to assumptions that people are making about you based purely on the color of your skin yeah, I think it's based on that. And I think it's also, especially maybe in like going back to college or school where you can you can see it sometimes where it does feel as if you're expected to find your group. So I had some friends and they weren't black. And I remember being asked by somebody who was black and they asked me, why are you sitting here? And I was thinking, why, why not? I still talk with you. I talk with other black people, but like the sense of, you know, I have to sort of, put myself into some secluded, exclusive group, it didn't really make sense to me. It was like, where can I feel like I can express myself better? And that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. Yeah. And we were saying earlier that on the podcast, we have historically always had a story time segment and a making life better segment. And the, the story that you've just been telling me about your experience fits to me as a story for story time. But it occurs to me that as well as you telling me your story uh, of your experience, I was also going to ask you for actions that people can take 
to try to help to change your experience. And the action that we were going to talk about is uh, recognizing that blackness isn't a whole identity. And I feel like that just naturally follows on from this conversation. So is there any advice that you can give to people around that? Yeah, I want to take the analogy of a house. So the way I see it, no matter who you are, your vase is kind of like, if you look at the house when it's being built, you've got a foundation. Like there's no way a house can stand or support itself without the foundation. And I kind of feel like that's my racial identity. Like being black is my foundation. Like I would not exist as a person if I didn't have that heritage. It's what makes me who I am. But I can, the same way how you have, you know, you have to have a good foundation. It's up to you what you want your house to look like. Like, I, personally, I think I want to have a mansion. Um, <laughs> but, you know, how that's built, that's up to me. Like, my tastes, what, what are my favourite colours, that sort of thing. That's me. It doesn't take away the fact that I'm black, because that's my foundation. You know, the foundation is definitely the most important thing, and you should respect that. This is my foundation, like this person, she's black. But then who is she? You know, you come to the doors of my house. What kind of furniture do I have? What kind of curtains do I have? What do I like to cook? You know, what's in my fridge? You know, that sort of thing. That's me. Yeah. So that's that's kind of like the analogy I want to give. It's a really nice analogy. I love it. OK, thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much, Claire. And that's the end of another episode. If you're enjoying the podcast, please do leave us ratings and reviews because it pushes us up the directories and makes it easier for other people to find us. Speaking of which, thank you to Cam, who thinks the podcast is fab. I've got a few talks coming up. You can see the details on my events page on Medium, which is linked to from my Twitter profile. And you can find that at Claire Sudbury, which is probably not spelt the way that you think. There's no I in Claire and Sudbury is spelt E-R-Y at the end, the same as surgery or carvery. You can find Made Tech on Twitter at M-A-D-E-T-E-C-H and do come and say hello. We're very interested to hear your feedback and any suggestions you have for any content for future episodes or just to come and have a chat. Thank you to Rose, our editor, Gina Cady, our virtual assistant, Viv Andrews, our transcriber, Richard Murray for the music, there's a link in the description, and to the rest of our internal MedTech team, Kyle Chapman, Jack Harrison, Carson Robb, and Laura Plaga. Also in the description is a link for subscribing to our newsletter. We publish new episodes every fortnight on Tuesday mornings. Thank you for listening and goodbye. <laughs>